Hello, everybody. Welcome to the third episode of Red Rot Tea House. It's been a minute since we've uh, been able to record, but we're so excited to get back into it with everyone. So for those of us, or for those of you who are listening to us for the first time, Red Rot Tea House is a simple little podcast where we look at a book, whether, and it, it tends to be political theory, philosophy, literature, it can really be almost anything. But principally, we're looking at books that are A, um, sort of a little bit outside the mainstream, forgotten, obscure, on the periphery, but are books that nonetheless contribute, or at least we think contribute, to the discourse or a discourse about something important in the world, about the world in which we live. So a lot of these books are uh, books that have a unique or important perspective that you, the audience, might not have considered before. The second major part of the Red Rot Tea House is our interest in sampling different kinds of tea. Now, I know, I, Alex, know very, very little about tea, but uh, that's kind of part of the fun. So uh, we, we get some tea, we make it, and I try it and give my first impressions with you all. So without further ado, quick introduction or reminder of who we are. I'm Alex Palma. And I'm Frederick Gettings. And we together are the Red Rod Tea House. So what are we reading today? What are we reading today, Fred? Uh, We are reading Capital is Dead. Is this something worse by Mackenzie Wark? Yep. Dr. Mackenzie Wark at the New School. Oh, yeah. I actually was surprised to see today as I was writing uh, her bio that she is semi-local to us here in Philadelphia. Um, So Capital is Dead uh, was published in 2018 by Verso Books. The book argues that capitalism, as controversial as it is, uh, is in fact already over. Actually, it's long dead. According to Wark, the information age has led to to uh, to to the rise of a new class dynamic that of the vectoralist versus the hacker class. This class dynamic supersedes the old capitalist versus worker dynamic that exists in older conceptions of anti-capitalist theory, I guess, or ex- exists in like sort of like classical conception, mainstream conception of the world in which we live. And it also, uh, so if capitalism is in fact dead, and if there is a new system that's been laid on top of it, this reality uh, so too forces us to reevaluate 150 years of uh, anti-capitalist, socialist, et cetera, Marxist theory, which work goes on at length about in this book. According to work, uh, we live in an unprecedented age that we're only really beginning to understand. She hopes that in this book, she can put to bed the idea that we live under a hyphenated or modified conception of capitalism. And instead, she attempts to make us realize that we live not under platform capitalism or post-fortist capitalism or late stage capitalism or capitalist realism or anything like that. We live under a whole new system now. um, And we have to come to grips uh, with that fact. So I'm excited to get into it. But before we do, I'll let Fred talk a little bit about the tea we're trying today. Right, right. Um, thank you for that summary of the text that we will be dissecting today. And, um, uh, you know, before I get into the tea, it's good to be back, hoping to, uh, you know, get back into the uh, podcast routine here and hopefully pump out some uh, new content and explore some, you know, new texts in various different disciplines. So today, what we are pairing with Capital is Dead, um, as the name of our podcast suggests, we try a variety of tea, as Alex mentioned earlier. And, um, 
you know, we sort of elucidate the history of it and, you know, the flavor profile and um, how to brew it specifically. And then at the end, Alex gives his impressions. And yeah. Uh, so today uh, we are drinking Lapsang Suchong. Uh, Lapsang Suchong is a uh, very interesting. It's uh, among one of the first black teas um, to be produced uh, specifically in Southern China. Uh, Lapsang Suchong derives from the Wuyi Mountains in the Fujian province of Southeast China, where uh, black tea was first developed. And uh, it came into existence in the 16th century, according to a popular myth. And um, essentially, there was a conflict between the uh, Qing dynasty, who at the time controlled northern China, and the Ming dynasty in the south. And the uh, story goes that uh, Qing soldiers were uh, basically passing through some villages in uh, the Fujian Mountains, or sorry, the Wuyi Mountains. And um, some of the locals were more or less kind of frightened and they packed their tea up and basically took it with them. Uh, So at this point in China, uh, most tea that was being produced was green tea, uh, specifically pan fried green tea. So stuff like gunpowder green or dragon well, as it's commonly referred to, uh, these were the types of teas that were most prevalent. Um, So when the people in the Wuyi Mountains were sort of fleeing these soldiers coming from northern China. They took with them their tea that wasn't oxidized already. And to sort of speed up that process while fleeing these soldiers and also sort of establishing their industry during the conflict, they would uh, not only pan fry the tea, but also smoke it over pine wood to sort of speed up that oxidation process. And this led to a very smoky and somewhat umami like tea. Uh, This quickly took off in the region, and the uh, local people of the Fujian province ended up exporting it to the Dutch, who at that time were establishing uh, trade routes in China and East Asia. And the Dutch brought Lapsang Suchong back to Europe, where it started to uh, gain in popularity. Uh, Lapsang Suchong is sort of the inspiration for Buhi tea, which was very popular in the American colonies here in the United States and to a lesser extent Canada uh, due to the quick oxidation process. Uh, Lapsang Suchong is also a component of Russian caravan, which is a blend of various smoked oolong teas in addition to a uh, Kimon black tea. So Lapsang Suchong has a very rich history as being among one of the first black teas. Um, it is very primeval in a way and um, very orthodox, which kind of fits with our theme here because Capital is Dead is about upending a sort of orthodox conception of capitalism and political economy. So what better way to... Uh, explore unorthodoxy with an orthodox tea. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Fred, for that description. And it's it's interesting, honestly, uh, if I can comment briefly at this time about the tea before I try it. Um, it's interesting that this tea, alongside um, the tea that we tried a couple episodes ago, Jen Mai Cha, are both teas that are sort of born out of um, hardship, I guess, you know, because this tea is smoked to quickly oxidize it so that, you know, refugees essentially I assume can like use it uh, or could use it um, originally and Jen Mai Cha too you know is is tea that's kind of cut with was it um, was it rice fried rice uh, yes it was a uh, toasted brown rice toasted rice yeah you know obviously not the same exact kind of hardship but the hardship nonetheless so I think that's kind of an interesting point no yeah for sure it definitely fits you know with the theme of uh power and its effects on uh those who don't wield it and um you know being a podcast that primarily looks at a variety of leftist and anti-capitalist or post-capitalist if you will literature um these sorts of teas with these sorts of backgrounds and origins very much fit into that uh, working class or precariat, if you will, sort of uh, direction. Um, yes, 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 yes. And so it's very thematic. I like it. Um, so before we get into talking about Capital is Dead, I just wanted to include a real, real quick lightning fast biography of Mackenzie work here. Um, because, you know, her 
realm is much larger than just the topics that um, she covers in this book. So I just kind of want to give the full story in case anyone out there listening to us is curious about one of the other topics that work gets into over the, co- over the course of her bibliography. And, uh, you know, maybe you'll like read something you like based on that. Um, so Mackenzie was born in Newcastle, Australia. Um, so she is, you know, what's the term for Australian person? Um, Aussie, I think Aussie, yeah, she's an Aussie. Received a bachelor's degree from Macquarie University, a master's from University of Technology, Sydney, and finally a PhD in communications from Murdoch University. Her work largely has to do with the intersection of politics, economics, and telecommunications. Uh, Beyond that, many of Work's writings are on gender, game design, accelerationism, phenomenology, philosophy in general. There's just, there's so much. Um, She really has a lot to offer, you know, throughout her research and throughout her writings. She's pretty open about her influences. Um, She, uh, you know, specifically her Marxist influence uh, in general specifically and we'll get we'll see this later in our discussion a lot of her work is influenced by a uh, guide the board the the french uh, avant-garde leftist he was head of the situationist international he wrote society the spectacle at least uh work has more of a situationist i guess leaning over the last say 10 years or so uh, her initial work is it's much more post-structural much more concerned with critical theory. Um, Work's earliest scholarly work began in the 1990s. In 1994, wrote uh, Virtual Geography, Living with Global Media Events, uh, and then The Virtual Republic, and and finally Culture and Cyberspace in 1999. Um, All these books were about how traditional media spaces and culture wars were interfacing with the then new-ish, growing-ish virtual space of the internet. Since that early era, Work has been expanding her realms of thought and influence into a variety of different topics, as I mentioned. But I think largely and chiefly, most of her work can sort of be likened to a kind of media studies, or at least viewed through the lens of media media studies. Uh, So today, Work, as Fred mentioned before, is a professor of culture and media and gender studies at the New School in New York City. She has written at least 20 books and countless scholarly and popular articles across all sorts of different websites. So, I mean, I think she has the potential to be have a huge legacy, um, huge, hugely influential someday, um, just based on the kind of work she's doing and the, the, the depth and the breadth of it. But I want to uh, real quickly, just for a second, talk about Guide the Board, who is a huge influence on Mackenzie's work, at, and in, especially in this book. Guide the Board was uh, born in 1931 in France and came of age uh, in the late 1940s when he joined the Letterist International, which was a French leftist slash avant-garde slash art slash academic movement. And when the Letterist International had a schism and kind of broke up, Guy went on in the 1960s to form the Situationist International and write in 1967, the Society, Society of the Spectacle, which is considered his primary work um his most known work and what the society of the spectacle is about and what the situationists were about they they talked about alienation under capitalism um and specifically they talked about how alienation was not just a function of capitalist econ- uh, economics or or capitalist production but alienation instead infiltrated um all aspects of life under capitalism, uh, including entertainment, uh, cultural life, um, literature, film, the news, television. Um, and uh, so, so 
Society of Spectacle went on to be massively influential. It's still very influential today, sort of an anti-capitalist theory, but it's particularly influential over work for, for a variety of reasons, which we'll, we'll see. So, so let's get into it. What about, well, how'd it go, Fred? How is this reading for you? Um, so this reading is honestly one of the most refreshing and I think thought-provoking reads that I've done in recent times. Um, I think Mackenzie Wark's thesis that maybe capitalism is not the best way to understand the situation we're in today is something that I myself have uh, considered and that maybe a new language and a new class model is uh, necessary in the information age, uh, which we see um, various forms of uh, production and basically exerting a sort of pre-order over the modern political and social state as a, you know, being necessary. So the book is sort of segmented into uh, seven different chapters, which uh, more or less cover different aspects of work's argument and a primary thesis. Essentially, chapter one deals with the need for a new language for capitalism or vectoralism, as we'll come to understand it. And um, essentially, Wark starts out with a quote from uh, Debord. I wanted to speak the beautiful language of my century. And I think that's essentially what this book is getting at, that we need a new language. We need a new analysis for understanding post-capitalism as Wark, I guess, understands it or tries to uh, you know, codify here. So the opening sentence of chapter one. One thing that the left and right now seem to agree on is that the society in which we live is called capitalism. And strangely enough, both now to seem, seem to agree that it is eternal. Even the left seems to think that there is an eternal essence to capital and that only its appearances change. So work essentially pulling, I guess, influence from Mark Fisher in a way is arguing that capitalism to the left is so pervasive, it's so essential to our understanding of everything from economics, politics, culture, technology, that to suggest that this is not capitalism anymore, like effectively renders leftist analysis or leftist ideology essentially sterile, that if this isn't capital, then it must be something else, which means everything that we believed in up till this point might either be incorrect or no longer applicable to our present situation. This kind of bleeds into another thing that war kits at here, that language has to describe change using the combinations and permutations of terms that language offers, the combinatory. The combinatory of terms always has something of a binary quality. If this is not capitalism, well, then it must be communism, the term that negates it. Since this is obviously not communism, then it must still be capitalism after all. And she writes this on page 22 of the first chapter. So essentially is that since we have not reached a state of communism, I guess in this like eschatological sense, this must be capitalism as if a new force or a new mode of production cannot coexist or supersede capitalism in the sort of evolutionary process towards that end. Yeah. So to, to kind of comment on all that, what I found really remarkable about uh, the first part of this book and what I find uh, thought provoking, challenging, uh, whatever, is that work does seem to have kind of a Mark Fisher-esque angle on the way we relate to capitalism or the lack thereof uh, in the world in which we live, right? So Mark Fisher, if, if, if you all aren't familiar, had this concept of, of capitalist realism in which he argued capitalism, capitalism is essentially uh, taken on an ontological form. It is, a, it is laid into being itself. And he, he found that to be a very difficult and pessimistic reality uh, or was a pessimistic reality for him um and i think in some ways work is sort of 
taking inspiration from and pushing back against Fisher here in saying that, you know, we have made, what's the term, a golden calf? We, we, have, we, we, we have calcified and, and othered and internalized uh, the concept, the abstract concept of capitalism to such an extent um, across uh, the political divide, across world politics, across leftist, right wing, whatever politics, to such an extent that we cannot really even properly describe the world in which we live, right? So instead, we have to kind of come up with these hyphenated descriptions of capitalism, surveillance capitalism, platform capitalism, everything else, uh, and everything else to kind of come to grips with the vague, strange new world in which we've lived over these last few decades. And I think that if we take on uh, her assertion that capitalism is really and truly dead and that it's, it's been long gone, there is potential that we could progress past some of the impasses and hangups uh, leftists have classically had uh, in making inroads towards a positive post-capitalist future mind you you know we're, we're equating to work already living in a post-capitalist era but I, I you know I, I think in that too you know there are some problems that are are, are sort of created uh, by this new terminology right you know uh, Marxism uh, anti-capitalism generally is such a teleological thing so often that if 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 you change the situation if, if you change the descriptor so radically i'm not sure if if left uh, if the left can and can truly um come to terms with it and i i think you know work gets into this a little bit more and I'll, we'll talk about this more later on when we talk about work's concept of a communism but yeah i i, I think that you know, as someone sort of anarchist persuasions, I, I sometimes, you know, work works conception of capitalism or lack there or the lack thereof aside. Um, I think that sometimes when we're talking about the world and talking about injustice and talking about why things are shitty so often, those of us on the left are pretty quick to jump to capitalism as a catch-all conclusion right like th this is the cause this is where this pain is coming from the profit motive the market all this stuff but uh, you know these things these concepts are kind of a moving target and i think if if you look at the world in which we live now and if you look at the world um that preceded capitalism a lot of the injustices that take place now and took place then exist nonetheless. So I think part of what I find interesting about work is that she encourages us to think not only about capitalism or whatever, but to think about what other systems belie us um, and if there's a hidden unity, right? And so for me, again, not to reveal my own bias, it's not so much about capitalism, although capitalism and you know the sort of post-capitalist whatever we live in now according to work schema um is so damaging but but the, the problem is and always was power and hierarchy and you know the way the powerful and the wealthy uh control the material conditions uh, and psychological conditions and everything else of of everyone else you know no, yeah. And I mean, like, I would definitely agree with that assessment. And I guess tying it into Mark Fisher's ontology, uh, work talks about a sort of capitalist essence, I guess, in the same way that mirrors that ontology that Fisher brings forth in capitalist realism. That um... it's almost as if, you know, nobody would really know or nobody really knows what to do. You know, if if we woke up and went outside and capitalism was over, nobody would really know what to do. Um, and I, I think, you know, work is so right in saying that we've like made this Ouroboros almost, 
this like dialectic out of capitalism. But go on. I'm sorry, I didn't inter- interrupt. No, yeah, yeah, no, no. Um, like getting back to that sort of essence uh, that sort of mirrors Fisher's ontology. That the main thing is, you know, she writes on uh, page twenty-seven. The main thing is we can sing the song of the essence and appearances of politics while gesturing to the master narrative that this is indeed and will remain capitalism, that there have been historically these different, I guess, analyses and assertions about what capitalism is. Uh, She goes over the sort of vulgar Marxism, that capitalism is economistic, that it's the economic base that more or less determines the political and ideological superstructures. And so long as that economic base is there, it's always going to be capitalism. And then there was the sort of uh, commodity form uh, variant, I guess, of uh, Marxism that argues, no, it's uh, commodity production and commodity exchange, you know, via decentralized production is what permutates or I guess uh, defines capitalism Uh, which would engulf everything from free market capitalism to various forms of market socialism that ostensibly claim to be socialist. There's also, uh, you know, the alt Husserians that everything is determined in the last instance that essentially, you know, the superstructures, both political and cultural, were separate from that of the economic base and therefore even if the economic base wasn't capitalistic, if the cultural and political superstructures were, um, it would still be capitalism. So, you know, there are these various forms of Marxism, both vulgar and genteel, as we'll get into later in this text. But at the end of the day, they all agree on the notion that this is still capitalism. And what work suggests that we ought to do is, you know, when we look at this through specifically a Marxist lens, that alternatively, rather than read the Marx corpus through the interpretative filter of a Marx essence, that being core sort of concepts, values, and eschatological predictions in his text, um, we read this through the interpretive filter of somebody else's texts or other disciplines that we can, as she would suggest, detorn Marxism and more or less synthesize it with other approaches towards analyzing political economy and social formation and politics, and maybe arrive at the conclusion that this actually isn't capitalism at all anymore, while at the same time maintaining the sort of dialectical materialism that Marx would sort of promote here. She gets into the torment, which, you know, comes from a guide to board who Alex gave us a pretty decent introduction of earlier, that the device of the torment restores all their subversive qualities to past critical judgments that have congealed into respectable truths. The defining characteristic of this use of the torment is the necessity for distance to be maintained between whatever has been turned into an official verity ideas improve, you know, essentially that the claim that this is capitalism because it has not yet become socialism or evolved into a communistic arrangement has sort of become a widely accepted truth in a Marxist, uh, you know, even anarchist circles to some extent, but that actually might not be true. We need to make these forms of analysis of a class relations of evolution of the forces of production and how that influences, you know, economic exchange and how that influences the cultural and political structures of our time, we need to make that subversive once more. And that first, the first step of doing that is developing our own language. And in doing that, we have to analyze what forces of production exist today, how that's affecting social relations and economic relations on the ground. And in doing so, by doing that, rather, we come to the realization that this isn't the industrial capital of capital volume one. This isn't the extractivist, you know, social democratic capitalism that people in the second and third international were, you know, attacking. This isn't even 
the neoliberal capitalism of the 1980s. This is something else altogether that leftists just have not caught up to in developing a language for, which is sort of the project that Wark is taking on single-handedly, it seems. It's um, it's interesting to me uh, for, for a couple of reasons. I'd be very interested to see if, if anyone else has um, developed a sort of post-capitalist theory uh, in the way Wark has here. Because I pr- I'm pretty sure somebody probably has, and it'd be interesting to to see if we could seek you know those people out and, and compare theories here, maybe in a follow up episode. Uh, but a, a quick a quick point about uh, detournement, which is a French word that I'm terrible at. I'm just terrible at pronouncing French things, French words. Um, but it's an, an interesting work uses this term detournement throughout the book several times, and as Fred said, it's 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 a situationist term. I think the letterists used it too. But the tournament is is sort of like a, a linguistic cultural hijacking, if you like. And so work suggests that we detourn Marxism to and, and hijack uh, some of its forms of analysis to come to terms with this new world we live in. But at the same time, this detournment and you know, in the 60s, too, uh, the tournament often had as a concept a sort of irreverent or vulgar quality about it, right? Um, so I think I kind of feel like on one level, what work is saying is that if Marxist analysis wants to survive, it has to stop taking itself so seriously, um, <laughs> which is kind of funny, kind of a funny thought. But I also wanted to take some time uh, before we get too uh deep in the weeds uh, and i was hoping uh, fred that maybe you could help me out if if we could talk about the primary new emerging classes or emergent classes or emerged classes um that work is concerned with in this book right so you know work having her expertise in telecommunications and media studies um articulates two primary classes uh, that of the Victorialist class and that of the Hacker class. Um, and for work, these two classes sort of lie on top of all the other class structures that are extant in the world, to, um, you know, under Orthodox, Mar- uh, under Orthodox Mar- Marxist analysis and conceptions of the world. So it's not so much that there aren't landlords anymore now that capitalism is over. It's not so much that there aren't capitalists even anymore obviously there are also still workers obviously there's still tenants but it's just that the hacker and the victorialist are sort of at the heart of what makes everything else go right so the landlord perhaps is dependent on structures of power that the victorialist controls and so too is the capitalist um but uh yeah actually so uh, fred um do you want to talk for a second about what the victorialist and hacker actually is because i think you have kind of a better way of articulating it than me Uh, no worries um so essentially like the victorialist hacker dynamic is the main class relation in vectoralism, which Wark asserts either superseded capitalism or exists alongside it. Um, Wark argues that since, you know, the landlord sort of tenant relations still exist within the framework of capitalism, it's just less dominant. There's no reason to suspect that the capitalist proletarian relation, you know, has not been superseded by something else. Um, So essentially, vectoralism is characterized by a shift in class relations, whereas the capitalist proletarian relation is superseded by the vectoralist hacker relation. Um, Hackers are those who produce new information out of the old, whereas vectoralists are those who control the means to produce that information, whether uh, it's software, the licenses thereof, uh, physical computation devices, or the vectors. Um, the sort of lines of distribution, if you will, and essentially take the information produced by that of the hackers uh, congealed in the form of stacks and distribute them across those vectors to influence broader economic, 
and social behavior. Essentially, hackers are those who take new information out of, or rather create new information out of old information. This is essentially the process of intellectual labor, as we would call it. So a hacker is anybody from a computer programmer designing the next Adobe PDF reader. A hacker is also somebody like Alex and I who are producing our own thoughts out of other people's thoughts, you know, doing this podcast. Um, A hacker is, you know, a Twitch streamer. A hacker is an author. I'm writing a new text and a hacker is a fashion designer. A hacker is essentially anybody who is not producing commodities or even services. They're producing information. They're producing abstract concept. The vectoralist is somebody who owns the means of distributing that information and capturing it in a way. Essentially, a vectoralist is somebody who has captured the commons of a abstract mental labor and has essentially commodified it for their own purpose. Um, Wark writes on page 44, hackers cannot be managed like farmers or workers. They are not the same as either class. There's no relation between units of labor time and the units of value produced. Something cooked up on the spur of the moment might have enormous value. Long hours of slog may end up being for nothing. The farmer and the worker The hacker does not usually end up owning the product of their efforts. Unless you own a drug company or a tech company or a media conglomerate, you might have to sell the rights of what you produce. So essentially, since hackers produce this information, but they're, you know, utilizing forms of licensed software or intellectual property that's owned by somebody else, they actually do not own the product of their own mental labor that's owned by the software company or the media conglomerate that has control over licensing. Uh, Think of the animators, for instance, who, you know, animate The Simpsons or Steven Universe or, you know, China, Illinois. Um, They don't own the actual content to that, but they're the ones who are doing this sort of labor and producing that. They're the ones who are animating these characters. They're the ones who are giving them life, uh, even doing the voice acting. They might be that character and they might produce that character even out of somebody else's ideas, but they don't own it. The Vectoralist does, who then puts it on the cable news network or you know YouTube or Hulu, which is then algorithmatized through you know Google search engine, which runs on Microsoft's you know Windows 10. So this all sort of cascades into each other. Um, There's a class that owns these sort of uh, distribution vectors of information that actually control the content, which is being produced by people who have no legal say over it whatsoever. Work also contends in um, the Hacker Manifesto, uh, not, I I don't think directly from the text, I'm reading an excerpt from the Anarchist Library, which will be in the description to this episode. She writes, information is no less real than physical matter and is dependent on it for its existence. Since information cannot exist in a pure immaterial form, neither can the hacker class. Of necessity, it must deal with a ruling class that owns the material means of extracting or distributing information or with a producing class that extracts and distributes. The class interest of the hacker lies in freeing information from its material constraints. So effectively, since abstractions are information, which itself is a signifier of some material matter, however, the vectoral class owns the means of producing that information, either through copyright or through software. Abstractions themselves are the physical means of hacking into existence new abstractions. Thus, whereas the working class seeks to liberate physical matter, the means of production, from the dictatorship of capital, the hacking class seeks to liberate abstractions through the elimination of legal and physical means of enforcing ownership of such abstractions. Um, so thank you, Fred, firstly. Uh, so two things. Firstly, if, um, to those of, uh, those of you who are listening to, to our podcast today, um, if, if you read capital is dead i personally strongly recommend uh that you either read 
the summary of the hacker manifesto on the anarchist library or read read the read the manifesto itself because reading about the manifesto really helped bring some of these concepts together at least in my imagination and so something that kind of helped me conceive of what the hacker vectoralist um dynamic is supposed to kind of look like is um actually like you know if if you look at some of the descriptions and you can look this up if you go online um look at the way people describe platform capitalism i think that some of the phenomenon that people point to when they look at platform capitalism or when they you know when you see critiques of of uh social media outlets or, or, or things like YouTube or whatever, um, you can kind of start to see where works analysis of this is coming from. So a great example of ha the hacker vectoralist um, dynamic is something like Twitch, right? Where you have all these content creators making this stuff, bringing people to the website. So the content creators, uh, I think, are probably one of the most common manifestations of the hacker class right the con the content creator is always making new ways to look at things right i mean and us too as podcast hosts as fred said we're creating content that's going to be on soundcloud right so we you know in this moment we find ourselves amongst the hacker class according to work's conception of what's going on um you know something like only fans too you know you have all these people making this content and and they are the hackers uh, in this scenario uh, and and the people who own the platforms the people that write the licensing agreements and the user agreements and the, the creator agreements and own the copyright own the licenses control the flow of information write the algorithms uh, they are the vectoralists here and what i think is interesting too is you know, the, the antagonism is, and, and this is too, also the case, right? I just want to emphasize like sort of in, in I guess what you, would, what you would say a standard Marxist conception of capitalism is. The antagonism is not only between a uh, hacker and vectoralist, but between hacker and hacker and between vectoralist and vectoralist, right? So, so Twitch, for example, uh, whoever owns Twitch has all this power over the content creators and the users that like go on the website. But so too is Twitch beholden to whoever has, you know, the, the domain is on GoDaddy or an Amazon or whatever. And uh, the operating systems and the software all have the operating systems and software that, that these websites are dependent on. Um, and for, forgive me if I uh, don't have all the technical jargon lined up exactly right when I describe this, but, you know, vectoralists, as much as they own licenses and, and um, control avenues through which information travel, they are so too dependent on other vectoralists that like own the structures that they're already dependent on. Right. Uh, right. So and so too under capitalism, right? Like a, a capitalist might be dependent on other capitalists. So their industries have sub industries. Contractors have subcontractors. Um, landlords, right, uh, might rent and uh, sell land, um, but they might be dependent on all sorts of other you own a condo and you rent it out. I mean, the condo is still beholden to the homeowners association, right? So there are all these like sort of overlapping antagonisms um, under classical, uh, under capitalism as it's classically conceived, but also under, under the system. Uh, I think that's important to keep in mind, just, you know, as a general awareness thing. Oh man. <laughs> well, yeah. And um, to like kind of go off that point, um you know, vectoralists do on some extent, you know, rely on each other much in the same way that capitalists rely on one another. Um, but like in that relationship, uh, work would assert too that, you know, the vectoralist has 
more or less control over the capitalist, but the capitalist has no form of recourse um, because in order to attack the power of the vectoralist to sort of free the commons of information, you would have to attack intellectual property, licensing, patents even, which you know capitalists use to sort of mid, like maintain monopoly over the production of certain commodities. But to tear down things like intellectual property or licensing, that creates a sort of a precedent for even abolishing private property, of course, which capitalists don't want because they have control over that. So the capitalist class is more or less put in this odd position where not only do not only are they superseded by the vectoralists, but they have to rely on the legal parameters which allow the vectoralists to exist in order to maintain their own existence. Alternatively, the vectoralist has to rely on the capitalist because while the vectoralist owns the information that can be rented out to the capitalist, the capitalist can stake the independent existence through the monopolization of the means of production and commodity exchange. Um, in other words, the vectoralist owns the pat or the licensing to software they own, um, the various sort of like algorithms which can help distribute the products of the capitalist, and they can sort of rent this out to the capitalist for you know a subscription fee. But the capitalist is the one actually producing the commodities for the vectoralist to then put on the vector to distribute elsewhere. So even though it's an antagonistic relationship, it's also a sort of symbiotic one in a way, um, which produces not only, you know, antagonism between the two, but also a direct reliance, you know, uh, whereas the capitalist frees capital from the fix, the spatial fixation of the land and sort of congeals it within the means of production, the vectoralist essentially takes capital and basically frees it from the productivist uh, productivist cycle altogether. Um, yeah, no, th- those are excellent observations. And, and you're making me think of, of, of a couple of things here. So I, I think the um, antagonism slash reliance that you mentioned makes me think of the extent to which all this points to a kind of a collapse of the concept of property. And that collapse, I think, too, um, kind of leads credence to Mackenzie's argument here, right? So under capitalism and the systems before it, but especially under capitalism, property uh, and property relations are extremely important. Um, right, you, you, you buy land, you rent land, establish means of production, you get workers to... to, to work those means of production for you. Um, And, you know, under all forms of capitalism, neoliberalism, post-Fordist capitalism, whatever, uh, property is extremely important um, and very sacred. Um, And it's interesting, over the last decade, last 20 years, we're we're increasingly seeing um, sort of infringements on the sanctity of property um, for the benefit of, you know, I don't know if you want to call it the vectorless class or entrepreneurial class or whatever, but I mean, look at things, look, look at all these uh, different manifestations of the gig economy, right? Um, with Uber, with Airbnb, with even, even like Bitcoin mining, where you like sort of rent out a part of your uh, computer's processing power. To, to, to create bitcoins you know you don't there are so many things that you don't simply own anymore right um ownership is a concept that's kind of collapsing in on itself right um and so property is becoming monetized in new ways and and you can talk you you could say that uh, these monetization schemes are actually a product of the cap of the hacker class, right? So the hacker class, for example, um, creates Bitcoin and conceives of Bitcoin mining as a way for you to use com- processing power uh, to create Bitcoins. But then those that vector, right, of monetization. Uh, hopefully, I'm understanding work 
here correctly, uh, gets captured and gets like scaled up and controlled by vectoralists. And then that's how you get <laughs> warehouses full of uh, Bitcoin mining rigs, et cetera. And I, I think it's interesting, you know, because you know, something like Bitcoin is reliant on capital to exist as much as, you know, again, not an expert on Bitcoin, but uh, Bitcoin is as much driven by Bitcoin mining as it is driven by speculation by capitalists, I guess. Right. You get what I'm saying, Fred? Oh, yeah. And uh, it's a sort of like piggyback on that. Um so I think like with the financialization of the economy and like the advent of Bitcoin, um, you know, we're at a point where economic value isn't being sort of speculated on anything that's actually being produced in the real economy. It's not being speculated on any resources that exist, you know, outside of, you know, human production. So things like gold, silver, diamonds, you know, things that naturally occur that have some utility to us. It's now being speculated on information, which itself is derives its value from speculation on other forms of information. So at this point, not only is, you know, property collapsing in on itself, as you sort of hinted to earlier, we now have this weird causal feedback loop where the information or the structure of the information economy not only monetizes and commodifies information, but the information that is thus commodified itself through its very existence is creating commodified information elsewhere, you know, um, absent any form of like human mental labor. It's interesting because, oh, man. This this might be stepping too far outside of the realm of what work is talking about here, but all this kind of reminds me of David Graeber's um, masterpiece, uh, Bullshit Jobs, in which he talks about how so much of our economy today, or at least when he wrote the book, but also, let's be honest, today, um, our economy is driven by nonsense, frankly, and the, the sort of uh, dynamic between the vectoralist and the hacker um, and the capitalist the creates a global economic system under which a lot of the value, as you said, Fred, is generated in relation. Um, a lot of our um, creates a global economy in, in which a lot of our... Um, a lot of the value that's created in the world is really kind of based on nothing. And it kind of reminds me of the children's book uh, and the emperor is the emperor. Uh, what is the, what the fuck is that book? The, the, it, make, it makes me wonder if the emperor has clothes or not, you know, in, in terms of Bitcoin, it's like, what, what is this value in reference to? Um, and I'm sure people are really, really deep into Bitcoin can give me all sorts of answers about that, but it's like, Am I kind of being bedazzled <laughs> over it? So anyway, th- not to get too far off course. Um, I know we've been talking a long time already. Um, but in terms of like what's to be done about all this, um, I personally find that the, 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 the crux of the book really sort of emerges or the point of the book or, or where work is ultimately going um, reveals itself in chapter six, which is unfortunately a very difficult chapter. (laughs) Fred and I, before we started recording, we're kind of trying to pull it apart a little bit. And so Fred, if it's all right with you, I'm just going to kind of briefly summarize what's going on in chapter six and what what the point of it is, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Go ahead. Be my guest. So chapter six uh, begins on page one, ends on page 123. And it kind of has to like in a long-winded way so in a long kind uh, in a long form long-winded kind of way chapter six uh, ha- uh is is sort of Mackenzie asking herself um what what is to be done about communism in a po- post-capitalist world right is the response to you know traditionally the the, the communism is supposed to sort of overtake capitalism and we're supposed to have a glorious new whatever 
world in which we live. But if capitalism is over, can the answer, can, can the, I don't know, antagonizing force to capital, uh, to, to whatever world we still live in. Uh, so we have this dynamic of the vectoralist versus the hacker, the, the capitalist, the landlord, the proletarian classes still exist underneath all this. Um, and so, so work kind of wonders, you know, what is to be done about all this? What can we do? Um, what should we do? And do the old forms of resistance still work? Can we still think about, can we still think about, can we still talk about, can we still aspire to communism if, um, uh, if it if communism is responding to a system that doesn't exist anymore, right? And so work tackles this problem in chapter six, which is unfortunately um, at least Fred and I found found this chapter to be pretty pretty difficult. Work begins by talking about uh, Heidegger and Sartre and and Lukacs. Is that how you pronounce it? Lukacs. Lukacs. So she begins chapter six by talking about Sartre, Heidegger, and Lukacs. And she kind of focuses it on Sartre and uh, talks about how he articulates in being in nothingness the concept of the in itself or for Sartre, uh, the object and the for itself um, or the subject. For Sartre and being in nothingness and um, being in nothingness is a response uh, to, oh, being in time. So Sartre's uh, being in nothingness is a response to Heidegger's uh, being in time. And being in time is a response, essentially, to George Lukacs' history and class consciousness, right? Um, but anyway, uh, for Sartre, the for itself is condemned to freedom and often seeks, through what Sartre calls projects, a means to which it can achieve of quote unquote lost sense of unity, but Sartre, um, but at least the Sartre uh, who's writing during being in nothingness, he he finds this to be an impossible pursuit uh, because ultimately there is no uh, God to fuse with, and there is no God to witness the full purpose of your pursuits. Um, only inert materialism. Therefore, for Sartre, uh, man is quote, a useless passion, uh, man and his experience overall. Throughout the Second World War, um, Sartre develops because of his experiences in the French resistance and also because of his interactions with Maurice Merleau-Ponty, the phenomenologist. And Merleau-Ponty uh, makes Sartre, according to work, realize that man is not condemned to freedom, but to meaning. And so out of that, Sartre grows a kind of a, a situationist edge and here you can see work once again sort of leaning on uh, the board for this um sartre explains that uh humans are free in their choices but they do not choose their situations right and this is what what work is getting at for sartre he realizes that material and historical conditions can be flawed and those flaws can lead to distorted choices amongst historical actors. And those conditions reveal a kind of inertia that exists and causes diversions and bumps in the road um, that uh, lead the forces of history astray. And, and, and for start here, you have the forces of history is understood as in a Marxist sense. Uh, so for work, then, this idea of inertia is an oppositional force, exists as an oppositional force against acceleration, right? And so we, we understand, and Mark would, uh, uh, and work would describe herself as a sort of accelerationist. So for work, what's opposing acceleration, and in, in an accelerationist sense, where the forces of, of capitalism or the forces of the dominant system of power sort of decay and develop into a new higher mode of society, if you like, are opposed not by negation, right? So acceleration is not met with negation. And I guess you could say it 
in a uh, Hegelian sense, but are rather met by a brick wall or maybe like bumps in the road is a better way to think of it. So work ends chapter six by talking about how Sartre struggled in, in articulating uh, Sartre struggled to articulate a truly atheist philosophy um, because he still struggled um, he start struggled to escape the concept of a big other, whether that big other be history or God, right? Um, so as much as Sartre tries to remove God from his conception of reality, um, he nonetheless leaves room for that absence, right? So, so work looking at that says then, so too do do leftists struggle with the dichotomy between capitalism and communism leftists struggle to come to terms with a world that's truthfully moved past both those concepts communism for leftists is obviously a big other capitalism for leftists is obviously also a big other uh, and they are unassailable concepts that don't really exist and so the the court uh the quote work specifically She says on page 142, maybe it's time to be an A communist, like atheist. This is not capitalism. It's worse, she says. We're free to desire another project for what might come after capitalism, but it won't be communism as it turns out. The exit from capital through external revolution was an off ramp not taken. God is dead. Communism is dead. It is, at best, the legacy code of the Chinese ruling class. But that does not exhaust the imaginal faculty of the subordinate classes, whose vulgar energies may even, in this practico-inert world, have some surprises in store. And I think, I think that's such a, a key point, because you know whatever ideological quibbles and um, characterizations we might make, you know, the, the world kind of goes on, right? And I think, you know, we're, we're living in interesting times, <laughs> those of us who are, who are listening right now, or those of you who are listening right now. I, I think uh, what work is getting at and what I would agree with is that um, the underclasses that exist in the world today throughout the globe are going to manifest action with or without Marxist terminology, you know, depending on how relevant these concepts remain, right? And so the, if the concepts don't adapt, then people are going to move past them. And maybe we, maybe they should. Well, yeah. And I mean, this sort of takes us into the seventh chapter, actually, um, you know, four cheers for vulgarity. And I, I guess like the whole crux of this part of the text is that vulgar marxism has been sort of shafted it's been ridiculed as being too precise or too narrow-sighted and that we need a holistic sort of or i guess totalist conception of a marxism rooted either in philosophy or some sort of theoretical discipline to sort of look at everything, you know, as the totality itself, that, you know, looking at Marxism through like an economistic lens is ridiculed as being too narrow sighted because it leaves out culture, it leaves out psychology, it leaves out all these various disciplines that can coalesce into a unified yet, you know, a rather a diverse yet cohesive analysis. However, what might actually be necessary now is a sort of vulgar Marxism and vulgar in the sense of looking at these new forms of relations, looking at the information economy and how that's influencing uh, market forces, but also the productive process, you know, looking at how information can be wielded in such a way to shift production around mass unionization drives and like, you know, Amazon or Walmart or how information can be basically synthesized and developed into millions, if not billions of models in real time to send production from the U.S. to China to Tanzania effectively to increase profit and, you know, product like productivity output, maybe looking at Maybe what we need is a sort of theoretical discipline 
that is vulgar, but also variant. And what I mean by that, uh, what we need is not a vulgar Marxism or vulgar anarchism or vulgar insert post-capitalist ideology here, nor do we need a totalizing version of that. But what we need is an array of vulgar Marxisms. We need an array of vulgar anarchisms that are rooted in things like computer science, information technology, media studies, economics, philosophy, psychology. And through these forms of vulgar Marxism, we can detour them and take and choose or, you know, pick and choose what's interesting and what's relevant and actualize that. Um, in creating a new understanding of what's going to come after vectoralism. So to be an a-communist isn't necessarily to, I guess, discard that it's acknowledging that, you know, the means of getting us there, you know, as we previously thought, are not as relevant anymore. You know, Mm. um, I'm sort of Uh, I guess the sort of play on the whole like atheistic notion of it, you know, a lot of atheists, you know, describe themselves as secular humanists, you know, they're engaging in the sort of process of meaning and morality absent of that of any belief in a higher power deities or organized religion. I I guess in a way, Mackenzie Wark is asking us to be sort of in in a kind of ironic way, Feuerbachian humanists in regards to the way that, you know, we see post-capitalist analysis to essentially get us there without the original framework that initiated it altogether. Damn. That's, uh, I think that's kind of, um, I think that's a good note to end on. What do you think? <laughs> Shit. Like, this is a dense text. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a lot there's a lot there's like there's a lot lot. that yeah like there's a lot a lot to discuss here and only Um, 172 pages (laughs) y'all yeah um but before we evaluate the book in terms of whether we'd recommend it or not it's time to evaluate the t so this is did you say lapsang how do do you pronounce Uh, this i'm sorry lapsang suchong Lapsang Souchon. I finished my cup. I had a big blue mug right here. Made it as per Fred's instructions. And I have to say, I'm I'm incredibly surprised by how this takes tastes. I, I yeah, mean, give me I, the deets. It it tastes like uh and don't take this the wrong way, but it tastes like meat. It tastes like beef jerky. <laughs> um it's very smoky. It has like you said before, an umami like body to it. Um, it's very hearty tasting. And considering the fact that it's snowing like a motherfucker outside, um really the, the perfect kind of drink for, for for this kind of evening. It's definitely a situational tea, right? There's like it's very strong, um, very very well, if you're not expecting it, it'll knock you down, man. It's, you know, what do you think? What, how do you? How, <laughs> I do like this tea. I do think I like the Gen Mai Cha a little bit more, but uh, I, I don't, I don't regret trying it. You know, I'm very glad you enjoyed this tea. Um, it's one of my favorites. Uh, you know, Lapsang Suchong. Uh, one of the first. It's actually the first black tea. And um, not only is it very situational, as you said, um, you know, it fits into the theme of our discussion today, uh, developing a new set of analysis and um, entertaining new possibilities about our current political and economic and social environment. Um, It's also just a very hearty tea. And, uh, You know, since we are in the same geographical region and it is snowing outside, I can't help but be reminded of a campfire, as uh, corny as that sounds. But um, yeah, you know, it just evokes very warm feelings. And uh, I always feel at home when I drink this, uh, wherever I may be. So Wait, uh, might I ask, you said this is the first black tea? Uh, Yes, yes. So black tea is actually a quite recent development in the history of tea altogether. Uh, most tea up until the 16th century uh, was actually green tea or oolong. 
or a white tea, although what constitutes a white tea is kind of up for debate. Uh, Lapsang Souchong was actually the first black tea. And um, it was after, you know, it's sort of obscure and hastily, you know, produced origin that black tea took off in the Fujian region of China and sort of gained popularity elsewhere. Um, black tea is most prevalent in India, uh, Europe, the Americas, and green tea is still quite dominant in East Asia. But, um, you know, black tea does have its origins there. And, um, you know, it has its origins in what we're drinking today, Lapsang Suchong. So, um, damn. <laughs> Fuck. Why is tea so interesting? <laughs> It very much is. And I, I appreciate you being willing to teach me about this stuff. Um, I did quite enjoy trying this. Um, so speaking of new modes of analysis, new bo- modes of being in terms of tea or anything else, uh, do you recommend Mackenzie Works Capital is Dead? Uh, is this something worse? Question mark. Absolutely. Um, it would honestly be... I would honestly kind of be like lying if I said this was not one of the most relevant, thought-provoking, and important pieces of uh, political literature um, in our time. And um, I can't help but think of like the current discourse that we see going on right now. We hear a lot about censorship, big tech, primarily from the right, but um, also on the left, you know, um, You have YouTube algorithms that push leftist content basically to the backwater. Um, You have essentially an algorithm that pushes, you know, garbage such as like Ben Shapiro or like Matt Walsh or this kind of content to the forefront. Um, But at the same time, you also have conservatives arguing that, you know, they're being shadow banned. And, you know, there's a lot of discourse about how information is being handled and how it's being presented. And um, you also have, you know, talk about cryptocurrency and NFTs, non-fungible tokens, which itself are, you know, hackers, quote unquote, creating information to sell to people to use on the blockchain, which itself is, you know, encrypted and anonymous information being used for various financial transactions through cryptocurrency, which itself is just information, you know, in the form of code. Um, You have the metaverse coming up, you know, Facebook's new project. You have uh, software being basically oriented through a subscription process. You know, you can't just go out and buy Adobe PDF reader, you know, um, Microsoft Office and own it, you know, as long as you can now, now you have to pay every year to have access to something that 20 years ago you would just buy the CD for and you own it. So, um, yeah, you know, the information political economy and this discourse is so prevalent. And I think this book really encapsulates the essence of all of it. And it really gives, you know, a new sort of class analysis that is rooted in Marxism. I mean, Mackenzie Bork is very much in the Marxist tradition, if not, you know, adjacent to it at least. And I think because of that, this text is a must read, even for people who may not accept her, you know, it might not be over. I think Bork's text makes us take a step back and maybe wonder about, you know, how we can move forward with attacking new forms of power who is you know politically conscious or anybody who you know interested in politics uh sociology economics anybody who just spends time on the internet uh digesting this sort of content you know you have a whole youtube slash twitch political community um you have large media conglomerates that people, you know, get their news from, like, uh, honestly, we're all kind of involved in this sort of political, this new political superstructure that, you know, is being sort of formed through the capture of information. 
And I think anybody who takes even a remote interest in that should read this text. Mm. I mostly agree. (laughs) As I alluded to earlier, I think there are a lot of people who will get a lot of out of a lot out of this book. There are a lot of people who would get a lot out of this book. Um, as you said, Fred, almost everyone is involved in this new conception system of power. We're all implicated. Mo- uh, almost all of us play the role of the hacker in some way in the modern world, contemporary world. Um, however, in terms of recommending this book, I would recommend it. However, I would recommend it, but I would recommend it. I would recommend it, but I think you should read the Hacker Manifesto first. Because if you read the Hacker Manifesto, you will get a primer for a lot of the stuff that work is talking about here. And I think that the Hacker Manifesto is a little has a little bit more clarity of purpose and it's a little bit more direct to the point. So I would say read Mackenzie Work, read the Hacker Manifesto first, and then probably also read Capital is Dead. Because um, I, I have to say, I, wish I, I personally wish I read the Hacker Manifesto first. But I think overall, Work is a fantastic thinker, and she's got a lot to say, a lot, a lot to contribute, um, and people should be paying more attention to her, honestly. Honest to God. Thank you, everybody, for listening uh, to Fred and I talk about Mackenzie Works, Capital is Dead. I hope you found this uh, discussion to be interesting. Um, and stay tuned uh, for our next reading. You've been listening to Red Raw Tea House with Alex Palma and Fred Gettings. Music by Finley Ondeline. Art by Marta Syrup. Mm-hmm.